I'm going to uh, introduce to you uh, one of the persons in the world that I admire the most and revere, and, and I believe he is the most admired uh, agricultural scientist in the world. And he worked for 60 years with Dr. Borlaug. They first met in Madison, Wisconsin in 1953. I was, uh, let's see, where was I in 50? I was, I guess, in sixth grade, but in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And if I had known you were there, I would have had my dad drive me down just to see you uh, and that. So uh, Dr. Swaminathan is the first World Food Prize laureate. He's the dean of the laureate corps. Uh, he is been a part of the World Food Prize since then. He is currently the chair of the World Food Prize selection committee that chooses our laureates. So uh, some of the laureates that you meet are, are here because of his work and the other members of our committee who remain anonymous. So uh, Dr. Swaminathan continues to be one of the most insightful and inspiring individuals in the world of global food security. And he's told me that his remarks are aimed a lot and right at all of the Global Youth Institute participants who are here. And uh, we're going to, though, let the other uh, adults uh, remain here as well to hear what he has to say uh, and that, but uh, he's, developed his uh, remarks in that uh, direction. So you all pay uh, attention, and there may be a pop quiz afterwards uh, on, that. So, on that. So now it is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. M.S. Swaminathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Ambassador Quinn. I hope my voice is, uh, reaches the, there, over there. Any problem? Any? All right, good, thank you. I want to make sure that everybody's able to hear. Chairman Rowan, Jenny Lobby, Borlaug, our 2014 laureate, Dr. Sanjay Rajaram, Ambassador Sandhu, other distinguished laureates, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Youth Institute. I was asked by Ambassador Quinn, this is the year, birth centenary of Norman Borlaug, Toward the end of this uh, Borlaug Symposium, uh, can we have a sort of a looking back over the years under what conditions Norman Borlaug began his association in India? What were the conditions then? What are the conditions now? And, uh, and as he said, as Ambassador Quinn said, I first met Borlaug when I was a research associate in genetics at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. There was an American Institute of Biological Sciences meeting where he and John Niederhauser, I had more relationship with Niederhauser because I was working on potatoes at that time, John Niederhauser. Uh, we, have, we were participating in the same session, and afterwards Borlaug said, uh, why don't we go to a drugstore? I didn't realize drugstores <laughs> provide everything. <laughs> in the U.S. it's a multi-purpose uh, institution, the drugstore. <laughs> but anyway, Bor Norman Borlaug said, let us go and talk over a little more detail. That is how they started. Later on, from 1960 onwards, we had a very strong relationship. Um, can you put on the slides? Well, for those who do not know history, after World War II in the 1960s, in fact, President Roosevelt had called a meeting uh, at Colonial Williamsburg to discuss the food situation. Finally, led to the birth of FAO in Quebec. Food and Agricultural Organization in Quebec. A uh, lot of books came in the 60s, very doomsday predictions. Borlaug used to get very annoyed with those books. One was Famine 1974 by Paul and William Paddock, who said that there will be very serious famines in 1974. By 1974, for three reasons, growing demand supply gap, increasing price volatility, even now price volatility is a major function in terms of hunger 
and threats of widespread famine, uh, because already Bengal famine in India, and so on. Paul Ehrlich, the population bomb, very famous, Paul and Anne Ehrlich are well-known population bomb, but they also had not much confidence that uh, we can overcome the population food supply gap, the human capacity to produce food, and the human need for food. There will be an imbalance between the two. Uh, that's what led to them. Sometime between 1970 and 1985, the world will undergo vast famines. Hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death. That is, they will starve to death until plague, thermonuclear war, or some other agent kills them first. India was always uh, the whipping boy because <laughs> the population was growing and food supply, the demand between food need and food supply was growing. So uh, even Anne Ehrlich, Paul and Anne Ehrlich said, the United States should announce that we no longer ship food to countries such as India, where dispassionate analysis indicates that the imbalance between food and population is hopeless. This was the diagnosis of uh, very respectable people. And the, it is under these circumstances, I'm giving a backdrop to Dr. Borlaug's early work, under what conditions he, he started his work. This was the Great Bengal Famine. This was the backdrop to India's independence. India became independent in 1947 from colonial rule. But 1942-44, there was a very big famine. But normally, these kinds of pictures have appeared uh, from African countries, unfortunately, sub-Saharan Africa. But at that time, the Indian newspapers also carried pictures of this kind, where three million children, women and men, uh, died out of hunger. Uh, and, uh, to the, and Mahatma Gandhi said, to the hungry God is bread. But today, uh, the situation is very different in almost all crops and in almost all areas. There has been tremendous agricultural progress. It was triggered by what was what is called the Green Revolution, or the wheat. We called it the Wheat Revolution because it started first in wheat, and then went to rice and corn and sorghum and millet and so on. But wheat was a starting point in India, in India, for the revolution. And today we produce over 96 million tons of wheat, and over 100 million tons of rice and so on, and also the horticultural production, fruits, vegetables from about 40 to 50 million tons. This year it is over 260 million tons. Over 260 million tons of food grains. In spite of the fact that some part of India or the other experiences drought, floods, it's a large country. Uh, I won't attribute everything to immediately to climate change, although there's a tendency to relate any extreme weather event to climate change. But the fact remains that we do, we do witness more, more often uh, either excess or deficiency of rainfall is ex Now this was the third World Food Prize Laureate, Ambassador Quinn, this is the third Food Prize Laureate, because Norman Borlaug felt food does not mean only gray wheat or rice or corn. It should include also other animal products, even fisheries. And so he, he went to this place called Amul. I don't know how many of you in this area have gone in, in, in Gujarat. It's a very well-known place. Uh, Operation Flood, it is called the Amul. And this one gentleman, Dr. Varghese Kurian, uh, more than anybody else, all, all whatever we achieve is usually a teamwork. But nevertheless, one can say he was the leader of the movement and his major contribution was cooperative, organized small producers, what I called the other day, production by masses or uh, decentralized production supported by key centralized services. Services in terms of uh, processing, uh, marketing, pricing, and so on. And uh, from 20 million tons of milk, less than 20 million tons of milk, this year is 140 million tons. The prediction is by the end of this decade, it will be 200 million tons of milk uh, will be produced, apart from other products and so on. You see, doubling wheat production is one thing, but doubling milk production is more, is a much more difficult process, it's much more. And that's why I'm glad the ambassador, he was chosen as the third laureate after Chandler, after me and Chandler, he was the third laureate. Now, Jawaharlal Nehru, our first Prime Minister, visited the United States and wrote a book called The Discovery of America. Earlier he's written a book called Discovery of India. This time it was Discovery of America. And he was very impressed with the land-grant college institutions and also what he called looking at the problem in a more integrated way. 
the water uh, fertilizer, the variety, post harvest management and so on. So uh, at this instance in the what we call the five year plan, second five year plan, an intensive agriculture district program was started called IADP. The major aim of this program was in the districts of India where there is irrigation, where there is water, you put the other inputs like seeds, fertilizer and so on. In other words, build on water, water as the central piece because without water, fertilizer can't be applied and so on. Now, it was started in a modest way in 15 districts, but I may, there was a lot of disappointment with the program uh, within a few years. It is not giving the result it, it, it was supposed to give. I made an analysis at that time and published a paper in which I said, the package of practices missed one important ingredient, namely a genetic strain which can respond to the rest of the package. In other words, the fertilizer, the water, you didn't have a genetic strain which could respond to the rest. This, this is what was made good with the help of Norman Borlaug. And uh, you, know, you all know the history of the height reduction genes uh, in the case of wheat originally from the Northern Experiment Station, Inazoko, Gunziro Inazoko uh, identified short plants with tall panicles. That was the difference between the earlier short variety. We had varieties like Tom Thumb, but they, they also Tom Thumb will have such a small panicle, yield will be very low. The advantage of these was similar, at this, almost at the same time, there was a discovery in the case of rice, uh, in the case of rice also DGU Gen, uh, short variety taken to Taiwan and from Taiwan to International Rice Research Institute and it spread from there. So the about the early 60s was the starting point of what we call a new plant architecture. New plant architecture which was designed for, it's like a good architect. You design a plant for taking more of nutrients. That's what Raja Ram also did yeah, with, the, with his very lines, the winter wheat into spring wheat and so now, as a result of this change, the atmosphere also changed, the mode of atmosphere, because farmers, we put large number of demonstrations in farmers. How the Borlaug report, the Borlaug report was introduced two days ago, uh, concentrates on yield gap. Why do you have bridging the yield gap? At that time, when the Borlaug came to India, our local varieties were giving both in wheat and rice less than one ton per hectare. One ton per hectare was the yield. But with our demonstrations, we showed four, five, six tons sometimes. Depends on the farmer. So the gap was very wide. It was not a small gap. It was not two percent, three percent. It was two hundred percent, three hundred percent, four hundred percent gap. Then what were the what? How was the yield gap uh, filled? Uh, how do you fill the gap between potential yield and actual yield? Four different approaches were de developed. One is called lab to land, taking the, bridging the scientific know-how, field level do-how gap. Between the two, you bridge the gap uh, by means of demonstrations and so on. That's called lab to land. Land to lab is taking the knowledge of farmers, particularly e their ecological prudence, their ecological prudence, and marrying it with the, with the scientific work. Mainstreaming local preferences also, uh, when we had some of the Mexican varieties like Larma Rojo, Rojo as the word indicates red. Uh, our, you know, those who know India, the chapatis, unleavened bread. If they become very dark, people don't like it. So they wanted more amber color uh, grains, not the red color grains. Fortunately, now Norman Borlaug, on the basis of what he had grown in, uh, in Pakistan, he went from India to Pakistan and made good selections of uh, material from Pakistan and sent it to us and we identified varieties like what was called Kalyan Sona, Sonalika, which had not only very high yield but also the desired chapati making quality. When I say land to lab, this is the feedback you get from the land that all right, you are high yielding all right, but it doesn't suit us from the point of view of culinary characters. Uh, your tongue is all equally important and therefore you have to have a right. Then the question of lab to lab, research networks were organized, many, many labs were linked together, SIMIT, CIMIT organized, ERI organized, a number of networks. That was a very useful contribution of international centers, of network of research institutions, what I call you can buy, purchase time. You can purchase time by take, taking material from one person to the other and also gain the knowledge. Finally, land to land, farm schools. Yesterday. When Dr. Emma was talking, I th thought to myself, 
the farm school is one where we put a dormitory in an outstanding farmer's uh, field, uh, provided they agree. And uh, the, the aim is to bring other farmers and farm women to that place for, for a week or a few days, get inspired by what they have seen. So it, it is spread from farmer to farmer, land to land. Uh, I was, when she talked, I was reminded by, by one of our own farmers who has almost adopted, uh, not exactly, but similar ones in Kerala, a uh, very small one acre person who earns a lot by this kind of planning. planning. We have put a farm school. In India, under the Corporate Social Responsibility Program, many of our banking institutions, financial institutions, are, are willing to provide money to agricultural institutions to put up such farm schools. Uh, learning from farmer to farmer. So you see all the methods of um, bridging the gap in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, were very fast. Well, Norman Borlaug first visited 1963 and we went, took him round. I myself traveled with him and that all over, all over the wheat belt, uh, identifying the conditions. Because when I first wrote to him to send some seeds, I said, seeds are no problems, I will send it to you. But I want to know under what conditions they are going to be grown. Because as you know, a seed alone is a starting point of change. But the fact remains it requires a proper agronomic treatment. Glenn Anderson, I put on this picture because Glenn Anderson was one of the finest person. Unfortunately, we lost him rather young. Uh, he, was, he, he went from India to Mexico to help Norman Borlaug. But I have never seen such a hard-working and very knowledgeable person. And I want to pay tribute on his occasion because he, he, gave, he, he gave his life for wheat very quickly. And I was a close, close worker with uh, Dr. Borlaug. Then Dr. Rajaram uh, took his place. I, you, can't, you, you can't have only genetics alone. I am a geneticist, but I, can't, I can have a variety with the potential. But the potential is revealed or not depends on the agronomic conditions. For example, we had to make a large number of changes in the agronomy between the semi dwarf varieties and the tall varieties. What our farmers were used to, for example, they were never used to shallow sowing. They were sow very deep and these did not come up. And they were blaming the Mexican wheat for not germinating, <laughs> for not germinating. Because the coleoptile cannot come up, you put it very deeply. So we had to tell them you irrigate. So I won't take your time now. There are a number of steps involved. All that I want to tell the young people is, seed is a starting point of change, but on the other hand, for the seed to express itself, on the one hand, you need agronomic practices, on the other hand, the public policy measures, public policy measures in terms of economics. Scientists can determine the production poten potential, but whether the potential is revealed or not is only done by public policy in terms of input-output pricing and in terms of uh, marketing assured and remunerative marketing. Without, without it, farmers won't grow again because the economics should be right. The economics is conditioned by policy. Norman Borlaug, apart from our scientific friends, he made friends at two ends of the spectrum. One is wherever he goes, in, in not only in India, Pakistan, everywhere, he likes to meet the farmers, farmers in the area. For example, these Rajasthan farmers who have put the t traditional cap on him. Uh, he enjoys, he, en he used to enjoy going around farmers. The other one is the policy maker. Yesterday also it was mentioned, uh, Prime Minister or Minister, because he, he understood that what we see is synergy between technology and public policy. The real outcome is synergy between technology and public policy. And therefore, two ends of the spectrum, uh, apart from the scientific stream, he had very close friends and who still remember him. We call Green Revolution as a symphony. Because all the pieces have to go together. Technology is the prime mode of change. The services which are needed to produce the technology like seed production and so on. Public policies which determine the economics. Above all, who are, who are producing the food? The farmers. We are only there to help them. And therefore, farmers' enthusiasm, our doctors, Ambassador Sandhus, uh, they are the leaders. <laughs> the Sikh farmers were really the leaders. They are, for example, this chap. Uh, national demonstration. It's a national demonstration farmer near Ludhiana and used to produce five to six tons of wheat without difficulty uh, when they are producing only one ton and so on. So synergy among professional skill, political will and farmers own toil. That's what makes the symphony. And I have written here the conductor of the sy this symphony, the early Green Revolution symphony was Norman Borlaug. Because the conductor, as you know, of a symphony orchestra 
He is a very key player. He is the one who shapes whether the, there is harmony in the in the whole group or not. Uh, uh, Zubin and so on, Mehta. Uh, Borlaug's passion from the beginning, even before the new wheat came, for genetic containment of wheat rust. He was always uh, concerned with all the three rust, the stem rust, the leaf rust, and the stripe rust. And uh, in the lecture I heard in Wisconsin, where I first met him, he talked about composite varieties, phenotypically similar but genotypically diverse. It's a very interesting concept at that time. Uh, I won't take your time to go into it, but you, you, you can, uh, you should understand those young people. What does it mean? Uh, phenotypically similar but genotypically different. Shuttle breeding. He was the first to start. He got rid of the photosensitive genes as a result of shuttle breeding between two completely different environments, Sonora and uh, Sidan Obregon. Then gene pyramiding and gene deployment strategy. And the last few years of his life, he was very concerned with UG99. Uh, Ronnie Kaufman will tell you about it. In fact, one of the very, very beautiful pictures uh, in science, I think, after his uh, far, far passing away, showed a picture of Borlaug in the, in the wheat field with young people telling them about the dangers of UG99. It was a very nice and moving picture just before, just before you. Now, one of Borlaug always used to tell me that one of his mentors, great mentors with E.C. Stackman, uh, because he's a University of Minnesota student, the, the day Ron Phillips had arranged their talk, and uh, they were saying, Borlaug is a Minnesota man. <laughs> and I think Ambassador Quinn also mentioned yesterday. <laughs> so the, he changed the career of Norman Borlaug from forestry to agriculture. But forestry's interest in Norman Borlaug continued to remain till the end. In fact, he used to write to prime ministers and president, please take care of your forests, otherwise you'll be in danger, hydrologic cycles will be interrupted, you'll have problems of more floods and so on. And so this was a very relentless battle against the unholy triple alliance of weeds, pests and pathogens. Stackman was fond of saying this as an unholy triple alliance of weeds, pests and pathogens. And Borlaug's passion was also to attack that unholy pet. Now, one thing which I remember discussing with Norman Borlaug in detail in the 60s was a book by, uh, by, by Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring because she pointed out the difficulties of DDT. DDT had won a Nobel Prize for the discoverer. On the other hand, it, it, I know in my own experience, uh, malaria was practically ex ex uh, eradicated as a result of DDT. On the other hand, there are long residual toxicity, the problems in the human stomach and so on. So Rachel Carson gave an early warning uh, at that time, the high-yielding varieties of wheat or rice have not come because some people attribute it all to the Green Revolution. Uh, if you want to use the word Green Revolution as a revolution of yield, m more production through yield, then the Green Revolution first start in Iowa. It is with, uh, with Pioneer and the company, the hybrid corn, I would say, technically, if the term if, if it had been coined earlier, uh, Iowa will qualify to be the first home of the Green Revolution starting with uh, hybrid corn, hybrid corn, and both company and the, that's a real technically because that the definition of green revolution is increase in productivity uh, through, pro, pro, increase in production through productivity advance. Now, when Rachel Carson published the book and there were a lot of comments about it, it, it created a lot of awareness of environmental issues that you can't o overlook the environment when the point of view, just going about yield alone is not enough, it's important. Then I coined the term evergreen revolution because it was clear to me that the only pathway which is available to us to produce more from less land is through productivity improvement, vertical growth in productivity, not horizontal growth in area expansion. There is no more area. Uh, for world requires, for example, 50% more rice in 2030 than in 2004 with approximately 30% less arable land as of today, increasing productivity in perpetuity without associated ecological harm. That's the definition of evergreen revolution. Increase in productivity, in perpetuity, without associated ecological harm. Ewo Wilson, after he read my article, he, he wrote to me also, very nice letter, and he, in his book called the, uh, the Future of Life, said the problem before us is how to feed billions of new mouths over the next several decades and save the rest of the life at the same time 
without being trapped in a Faustian bargain that, threaten, that threatens freedom from security. The benefits for, should come from an evergreen revolution. The aim of this new thrust, that is the evergreen revolution, is to lift production well above the levels attained by the green revolution of the 1960s using technology and regulatory policy more advanced and even safer than existing. Uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised when President Obama, I was for some years a nominated member of Indian Parliament, so I used to be, I, present, I was present at his lect a lecture in Parliament, President Obama. Together he t told the parliamentarians of India, of which I was one of them at that time, Together we can strengthen agriculture. Cooperation between Indian and American researchers and scientists sparked the Green Revolution. Today India is a leader in using technology to empower farmers like those I met yesterday who get free updates on market and weather conditions on their cell phone. I think here also mention was made of the mobile phones. And the United States is a leader in agricultural productivity and research. Now as farmers in rural areas face the effects of climate change and drought, we should work together to spark a second, more sustainable evergreen revolution. Evergreen revolution means, as I said, improvement in productivity in perpetuity. I have given some data in wheat in India. Uh, gradually, it's been going up. It's been going up uh, from 7 million tons in 1947 to 97 million tons in 2014. We are hoping to achieve about 150 million tons by 2030. That is our target. Uh, to call for 2030, 150 million tons of wheat from 30 million hectares. In other words, 5 tons per hectare is what, at the moment, to 3, 3.5 uh, tons. Punjab has more. Punjab has almost 5 tons of wheat, 5 tons of rice. So that 10 tons it comes. The, the, the reason for optimism, uh, again, is a seed sown by Borlaug. Uh, we can develop varieties which are highly resistant to all the three rusts. We can checkmate the rest by genetic means. Secondly, we can increase the photosynthetic efficiency of the plant. For example, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute scientist, Dr. Indu Sharma is here. Uh, she is the director of a wheat program, done remarkable, remarkable work, the wheat program of India, right from 1960s. This new variety, HT2967, a major breakthrough in wheat breeding, uh, and uh, it, it has become so popular very quickly because farmers are ultimate judges of the value of a variety. Now let me relate it to what we have done to the Zero Hunger Challenge of the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. You all know it, Zero Hunger Challenge, Zero Hunger by 2025. 20, uh, and the five components are known to you, so I am not going to take time. One of the reasons why the Zero Hunger Challenge was, apart from the fact it was stimulated by a past uh, food, nah, food, World Food Prize Laureate, Mr. Lula, President of Brazil, who was one of the World Food Prize Laureate, uh, South Asian enigma we call it. South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are the hot spots, the two hot spots, both from the climate point of view, climate sensitivity, as well as from the point of view, prevalence of malnutrition hunger. Extraordinary economic growth, population largely dependent on agriculture, yet two of the five children stunted. For example, I was telling Ambassador Sandhu that 80% of people in Afghanistan depend on agriculture for the livelihood. In India it used to be so, now it's about 60%. Now the price volatility is one of the real problems when, when, when you have incre increased uh, variability in production, demand supply situation. But this I have written, the future belongs to nations with grains and not guns. Guns you can purchase, but in the future the grains will be more. This is why it is important for countries to pay attention to research. Those who are interested in how to achieve zero hunger, uh, a small editorial I wrote in Science, 1st August 2014. You can look at it. It is a condensed version of the strategy for achieving zero hunger by 2015. The three major dimensions of hunger, when we talk about hunger, we talk only about hunger. But the three major dimensions, you have to disaggregate the problem in order to overcome it. Uh, one is calorie deprivation or undernutrition. Second is protein hunger, protein deficiency. And finally, hidden hunger, hidden hunger, which is micronutrient deficiency. For 2016 has been declared by the United Nations as the year of pulses. 2015 is the year of the soil, the year of the soil. Uh, I saw somewhere Dr. Atal Lal, people like him, uh, will be developing programs for the international year of the soil, overcoming protein hunger, the pulses revolution. What we have done is we have in India 
uh, what we call panchayat, the local self-government. They are elected. 50% are women. We are now trying to convince them wherever there is not much water. The pulses or the grain legumes are high value but low water requiring crop. We, they require high value but low water requiring crop. And so we said you grow them. So they now form themselves into groups called the pulses panchayats. The CGIR has actually promoted under the Harvest Plus program biofortification. There are three methods of biofortification. One is naturally occurring, bio, what nature has done already, biofortified plants. Secondly, from the last vast collection, for example, Icrosat or Eri. Eri is over 100,000 varieties of rice and Icrosat has very large collection of millets and so on. Same is similar. Uh, most of the international institutions have large collections of germplasm. From those germplasm, you identify it by breeding and selection. It is not genetic modification. The third approach is the genetic modification. Ingo Portricus and the, the whole area of golden rice is a very good example. The golden rice is a good example. For example, naturally biofortified crops, moringa, drumstick. According to the National Geographic, a recent article, 25 times the iron and spinach, 17 times calcium in milk, 15 times potassium in bananas, and so on. Nine times protein yogurt. How can you? Nature has produced such as strong biofortified plants, and this can be used in agroforestry system. Agroforestry. You can mainstream nutrition today. Everybody is talking. Free is talking about combining uh, agriculture, nutrition, and health. Look at the problem of the three because they are very much strongly interrelated. And even the FAO has now said we should not talk about food security, but food security and nutrition. Add the dimension of nutrition. Add the suggestion of the high-level panel of experts, of which now Dr. Perpin Sapanderson is distinguished chairman. Enormous diversity in these millets, uh, earlier unfortunately classified as coarse cereals. They were not, they are also called orphan crops, which have not received adequate attention from scientists. But you find enormous amount of variability. We call them in my foundation as climate smart uh, nutri, nutri cereals. I don't call them coarse cereals. Uh, climate smart, in fact, there was an article, uh, the, and then the, many of these uh, women are great conservers, particularly what we call tribal indigenous women. They, they have tremendous knowledge, their memory of uh, what the plants are useful for is remarkable. For example, this Kanda, Kanda tribe in Orissa, 124 medicinal plants, uh, cultural diversity, curative diversity, culinary diversity, these are all the foundations of diversity. To conservation of diversity, the culinary diversity, cultural diversity, curative diversity, and ecosystem diversity. This was from a paper, newspaper from an article on Californian drought, and somebody was saying we should go back and bring back the old millets, uh, which are much more tolerant to drought. In other words, traditional wisdom or dying wisdom, uh, revive the dying wisdom, revive uh, the dying wisdom and vanishing crops. It's very important to and here are, I think, the two laureates. I showed uh, Dr. Korean's picture earlier. Surinder Vasal is here. Uh, and she and Eva Villegas uh, got uh, the World Food Prize in the year 2000. Quality protein maize. This is one of the uh, favorite uh, areas of interest to Dr. Borlaug because he felt quality protein maize, if it is developed well with high yield, can make a large difference. This is the one, the second step. One is the naturally occurring biofortified crops. These are bred. This was bred by Icrosat along with Nirmal Seeds, a company and the Icrosat joined together and produced a variety of pearl millet with a very high iron content and all at the same time higher yield also. Because since we don't pay by quality, the market doesn't usually pay by quality unless the yield is also good. Farmers will not uh, take it up. So you have to, that is the problem with the quality protein maize. You must have a maize which is high yielding and at the same time good in quality. This was given to me by your last year's laureate, uh, Bob Fraley, uh, the very first, the beginning of the genetic modification. 1953 was the beginning of understanding of molecular genetics as a result of Watson and Crick, whose contemporary I was in Cambridge. But uh, later on, 30 years later, 1983, the first genetically modified petunia. In fact, uh, he gave me a plant, uh, the original uh, Bob Fraley, and I have kept it in, my, in our museum. Now, let me say a few words. Yesterday also there was talk about uh, the biotechnology and so on. In India, we have only one, one strain so far, one crop, where genetically modified food has been allowed. Not food, 
genetically modified crop has been allowed. This is in cotton, in cotton, BT cotton. Those of you can see this curve, you see how the production has gone up. Production has gone up, uh, the yields, as a result of yield revolution, not area expansion. Uh, but wherever there is a, now the second generation, because as you know, those who are breeders, genetic heterogeneity is very important to limit genetic vulnerability to pests and diseases. If you don't have genetic heterogeneity, this is why Borlaug's varieties are all very low, very, very, very wide germplasm, uh, so that they don't have. Golden rice, I mentioned about uh, the golden rice work earlier, very, very beautiful scientific work in terms of um, beta carotene enrichment of rice. On the other hand, it has got a lot of problem in the field. This was a recent photographs uh, from Philippines where NGOs, non-government organizations entered a golden rice field and then they cut it off, they damaged the whole thing. So there is a fear that these are not good, although we say they are rich in vitamin A, <laughs> they are not good. So public perception of science is different. In fact, the science magazine has been emphasizing the need for more, more conversation between scientists and the people, the public, the public on one hand, uh, Royal Society of London has a committee on public understanding of science. They have also established recently a committee on political understanding of science because these two, both the public and the political leaders, have to be convinced before we can have. So, uh, Borlaug was very concerned about this whole area. I have just taken a small quotation from one of his articles. Large number of articles are there. Although we must be prudent in assessing new technologies, these assessments must not be based on overly conservative or overly inaccurate. Uh, they must be based on good science and good sense. Good science and good sense. It is easy to forget that science offers more than a body of knowledge and a process for adding new technologies. It tells us not only what we know, but what we don't know. I think he was very cautious in one sense that we must use good science and good. Well, I, this, uh, I have always said, I have, I have had a privilege meeting Mrs. Borlaug for a few times in Mexico and other places. I call her the unsung heroine of the Green Revolution. Uh, remarkable, I think, but for the support she had given, the daughter is here, so she will know better. But I think it, we generally forget the fact that uh, we talk about a person, but uh, the persons who have received this kind of support. So I want to pay on this occasion a tribute to Margaret um, uh, Borlaug, who is a remarkable lady, and uh, uh, we should remember now, President Roosevelt wrote an article called The American Dream. I have adapted it to the Zero Hunger Dream. I said, new frontiers of the mind and technology are before us, and they are pioneered with the same vision, boldness, and drive with which the battle against food shortage was fought by Borlaug through the Green Revolution. We can achieve the Zero Hunger Challenge goal sooner than generally considered possible. It's an adaptation from the American dream, but the zero hunger dream, what I call Norman Borlaug's dream, this one was within the American dream, a zero hunger dream. Now, in India, the government of India and uh, CIMIT, uh, the DG, distinguished DG is here, uh, on his initiative, really, initiative, the Borlaug Institute for South Asia has been created. It's a consortium of seven nations. All the seven countries are agri-based economy and need uh, much more strengthening of R&D agriculture. The government of India has do donated, uh, government of India and our state governments have donated uh, land worth about $1.5 billion. This is one and a half times the budget of CGIR. The land alone which has been donated to the Borlaug Institute at a present cost $1.5 billion. It will go up <laughs> land in the India such a precious commodity, so that you had Ludhiana, Punjab, Northwest 500 acres of land has been given adjoining the Punjab Agriculture University farm, Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh, where soybean work, I met some people here, uh, we had strong collaboration with the University of Illinois and so on in soybean, 550 acres of land, uh, then Pusa, Bihar, where the originally the Indian Agricultural Research Institute was established, 150 acres of land have been given and Tom Lumpkin is here and I hope this institute will fulfill its promise. It has got the land, all our fertile land, irrigated land uh, with a very good uh, with, with good in infrastructure has to be developed. 
Now, as you enter the laureate's hall, you find this quotation, which I think, can you have put my, <laughs> from my, but I thought it is an appropriate ending. Again and again in history, some special people wake up. They have no ground in the crowd. They move to broader laws. They carry strange customs with them and demand room for bold and audacious actions. The future speaks ruthlessly to them. They change the world. I think one of those who has changed the world. Ladies and gentlemen, here is an unusual man, a great man, a gift of God to humankind. But I think it's important that we continue that legacy, continue, celebrate his life, uh, not talk only about what he did, but what we are going to do. As Kennedy has said, ask not what America will do for you, what you will do for America. Similarly, Borlaug will ask the same question. Ask not what you are saying about me, but say what you are going to do to continue my legacy. Thank you very much for your hearing. Well, MS, uh, sitting there listening to you, it's this incredible review of Norm's life and everything. It reminded me that uh, the Borlaug report, which we conceived of, was to take the place of Norm, because when Norm would come and speak, he'd give the overview of the world. And every woman would listen, and that's all you needed, was that. And I, sitting there realizing, you now have taken that place. And this is the Swaminathan report and the assessment of the world. I think everyone was so deeply impressed by your overview of this greatest period of food production in history and now the greatest challenge that we face. And it's never been more clear for me. So thank you so very much. But I have something. Uh, that we want to uh, stay here, Zach, stay here. Um, this is the World Food Prize Ambassadors Award. So this is a new award presented to MS Swaminathan for your invaluable contribution to the World Food Prize Foundation and for your support of the legacy of John Ruan and Dr. Norman E. Borlaug. And it's signed by me and John Ruan, our chairman. Thank so. you, John. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.